The future is here and it sucks. When I was a kid, I was promised flying cars and an AI assistant in the form of Rosie the Robot by the time I was the age I am now. Unfortunately, we were lied to by futurists and tech gurus who, it turns out, just make shit up most of the time like a 19th century grifter who also wants to steal your blood. If you asked John Polidori to describe what a 21st century vampire would look like, it would just be Elizabeth Holmes. As a millennial for about half of my life, I grew up without most of the advanced technology that is commonplace now. I remember a time when there wasn't even a family computer in the house and when one did finally arrive, it ran MS-DOS and you had to have a computer science degree just to operate the thing. And before cell phones were prevalent, our parents would just tell us to be back by seven or eight o'clock and we would go temporarily missing for several hours, left to our own devices where we'd inevitably find woods porn. There were no commercial GPS trackers in our pockets, no Instagram or TikTok that would distract from experiencing life around us. And memes weren't a form of communication, so you had to come up with your own jokes rather than regurgitate funny shit from a viral video or an image <clears throat> macro. What an actual nightmare. <laughs> I gotta think for myself. If you wanted to go somewhere, you had to either have your own car or know somebody that did because depending on what part of the country you were in, public transit was, and still is, basically non-existent. So you had to walk everywhere in cities that are unwalkable capitalist labyrinths of billboard-laden strip malls. You couldn't just order an Uber or rent one of those dorky scooters or e-bikes and the idea of a self-driving taxi was pretty pie in the sky. We were nowhere near living in a Johnny Cab Total Recall future. Was it a simpler time? Maybe? Was it less convenient? Absolutely. Is that, however, an inherently bad thing? No. Technology, when implemented ethically and responsibly, can improve the world by making it more convenient and accessible. The problem is that capitalism, or really any system that values profits over the well-being of citizens and the general public, needs to achieve ever-increasing margins and growth to be considered successful. The quickest way to that goal is to lobby for deregulation. And when that falls short, just release a piece of technology that you're still beta testing that temporarily incarcerates its users on a dark road in the middle of the night. Literally, lane three of three. It's a little scary. Uh, we're working to get you back on your way, okay? Okay. So we're gonna have to deal with a human now. Hi, Blumhouse Studios? Yeah, you know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this! You see, when I was a kid, never did I think about all the ways something like self-driving cars could actually make life even less convenient and annoying and potentially deadly. Well, more deadly. Waymo hasn't killed anyone yet, but Tesla's autopilot sure has, and there have been allegations that the software shuts off mere seconds after perceiving an oncoming accident, leaving any damages or deaths, the liability of the driver, not the technology itself or the company. While the Waymo cars haven't killed anybody, they often just stop in the middle of the road or crash into each other, but also sometimes pedestrians. With over 7 million miles driven and only three accidents to date, the data might look good, but my first thought is, who's liable for these accidents and how do we proceed when there's not an individual to blame? Are we going to prosecute robots and AI? Are there laws in the books that deal with this? And if not, how long before there are? What is the moral framework for what is essentially the trolley problem where the car must choose between ramming into a cyclist and crashing through the front of a bodega? What about insurance? Will my premium go up if my autopilot Tesla runs a red light and causes a 10 car pileup? The whole thing is just like a really boring episode of Black Mirror where the dystopian threat is just red tape and filing complicated insurance claims. And as with most new technologies, traditional liability and regulations might not yet address scenarios where human decision making is replaced by algorithms and AI. I'm being hyperbolic here to a certain extent, and it's not like the cars are taking people on a <laughs> crazy taxi speed run through the city or kidnapping passengers in the classic sense or self-destructing at stoplights. They're just kind of timidly entering intersections and playing it extremely safe when making a right turn on red 
that makes any unfortunate soul stuck behind it go insane, leaving them screaming at their windshield who's just trying to make the light. I work downtown in the financial district in San Francisco and I see these fucking things all the time looking so nervous to do literally anything. Like say, when it gets stuck behind a parked semi. Uh, other cars are going around us. Smart. Okay, Waymo, learn from them. They can't find the confidence within themselves to pass and I can't help anthropomorphize the car and imagine that it's just really worried like a new driver who just got their learner's permit. He's just shy. <laughs> Other times they get scared when encountering the police, which to be honest, is understandable. Yeah, it's gonna mess up the, uh, the rescue. But if I, if I pop a flare, what do you think? I'm curious. I hope so. How long do you think it'll be before a cop unloads on a malfunctioning driverless car because they feared for their life? <laughs> I mean, that one cop got scared of an acorn, so it's gotta be in the next couple of weeks, right? Shots fired! Shots fired! You know. Hey, also, what happens if one of these things gets pulled over? We would, um, talk to the police. Um, we also have Waymo roadside assistance that is never, um, too far behind. And so we would disp dispatch our roadside assistance over to the scene. Does that ever happen where like, it's just pulled over like Not so far. for speed or anything? Not for me. What a nightmare it would be waiting for their roadside assistants to show up and try to explain to the CHP officer that it's just a driverless car. Now imagine that it's this guy that pulled you over. He'd demand the AI software step out of the car and place its non-existent hands on the trunk. He doesn't need to, sir. I'm not talking to you, okay? He does not need to. I'm not talking to you. He does not, please call your supervisor right now. He's here. Where is he? He's here. Please identify yourself, your badge number. He's here. Police training in California is only about six months which seems wildly low considering the amount of situations they have to mediate, and I can't imagine they're gonna add another couple of weeks or months that's just about what to do when pulling over a driverless car. And this all speaks to the mindset within these startups when creating and releasing new technology. Don't worry about educating law enforcement or even the general public on the technology itself. Just disrupt and break every pedestrian shaped egg and clean the mess up afterwards. Cops already can't tell the difference between a combustion engine and electric cars. You think they're gonna be able to identify a driverless one? Uh, what, uh, what are you doing? Well, put a ticket on you, Phil. Why? Well, it says uh, electric cars only. This is an electric car, you got a ticket. No, no, but this is an electric car. This is, this is, it's a Tesla, mate. No, it's not an electric car. Other times these self-driving cars just whine helplessly in the middle of the night when they find themselves in a new neighborhood, scared and confused. <laughs> Please close the right side rear door. They seem to have a real hard time seeing or understanding yellow caution tape as well and just roll through police lines. It's gotta be hard enough to ensure the integrity of a crime scene when you've got investigators and other cops walking through it. But now you have to deal with a 3,500 pound car crashing through your crime scene, making one crime scene into two much more confusing ones. How do you even deal with this situation? Yell at it like a dog? No, you stay. Oh, I guess so. <laughs> And speaking of being places it shouldn't be, these cars can't figure out construction zones and freeze up like a child whose turn it is to read in front of the class. These things seem to be incapable of improvising, which I guess I don't really want from my machine learning algorithm because that's how you end up with Waymo hunter killers. I am a little confused though, because Waymo claims that their machine learning is cutting edge. Quote, every major part of our software, whether it's perception, behavior prediction, or planning, uses advanced machine learning models that benefit from our unparalleled driving experience from more than 20 million autonomous driven miles and the richness of the data our sensors gather. And yet it freezes up when encountering an orange construction barrier. Right. So what's it like being a passenger in one of these things? Well, if you get stressed out at just normal driving, I do not recommend it. <laughs> oh, oh shit, you're crazy. Oh my god, oh my god, oh fuck, what the fuck?
As if making a left hand turn at an unprotected intersection wasn't stressful enough already, you're literally letting Jesus take the wheel in one of these fucking things and praying you don't get T-boned when it hesitates on the follow through. And not being in full control, these things become literal rolling death traps even when at a stop. On Saturday, Robert and his husband said a person who looked homeless was trying to cover the sensors of the vehicle as the light turned green. We felt trapped in the sense that we didn't know what to do in that instance. We didn't really have an, an understanding. Do we get out? Was it safe to get out of the car? Were you concerned for your safety? We were because of the situation. The vehicle didn't move and minutes later that person walked away. Waymo emailed them saying, in part, when a pedestrian attacks the vehicle, we advise riders to remain inside the vehicle. When those sensors are blocked, it's equivalent to basically someone putting a blindfold over the eyes of, of a driver and they're unable to move. You don't even have to be doing something crazy or illegal like speeding or risking that left hand turn for it to put you in harm's way. These things are vehicular pacifists, I guess, and just end up taking whatever beating or vandalism a sadistic human might inflict on it. I am not getting into one of these things until they include defensive countermeasures so I can blast my way out of a situation like that. But don't worry, it's also programmed with a rudimentary version of Data's emotion chip from Star Trek and can tell you some fun jokes while you wait for the lunatic to breach the door. I'm gonna have to stop for gas. Just kidding. I'm gonna have to stop for gas. I'm gonna have to stop for gas. Okay. I, maybe it's just the one joke. <laughs> I don't want to sound like an old head who hates progress and technology. I just want there to be a little more vetting before unleashing a two-ton rolling lithium battering ram onto the street that lacks sufficient accountability and safety. I'm pretty sure these things also contain proprietary data and software that would have to undergo some kind of investigation when their unstoppable force of a car collides with a family of four. And I'd wager companies would be less than enthusiastic to disclose such data to the public when they inevitably end up with a lawsuit on their hands. And I'm not the only person who is a little wary of these cars' safety as people have taken it upon themselves to rid their streets of them by any means necessary. Edwin Karen Gay came to Chinatown for Lunar New your celebration Saturday, but never expected things would take a destructive turn like this. A Waymo driverless car stopped in traffic, vandalized, and set on fire by a group of people. So far, there's only been one incident that I could find of a Waymo car being absolutely torched in the street, but that's how these things start. Just one person acting with ill intent to start a full-blown riot, as proven by any time a sports team loses in any given major city or wins. It really doesn't matter. People are just gonna light shit on fire no matter what. Some people were upset by the destruction of property, but they don't understand that while it might have been some people acting on their more base impulses to get away with destroying something scot-free, I think on a subconscious level, it's more about the destruction of a symbol of a system that disproportionately serves the few and not the many. Most new technology is typically expensive and only useful to a very small portion of the population, which to a degree, Makes sense. A company creates a product for those with money who might buy or even invest in that company, which then infuses said business with some capital. But when a company reaches a certain size, you can either make a consumer product that's more affordable for a wider audience, or in the case of Apple, keep pumping out products that are out of reach and useless to the majority, or products that, you know, have planned obsolescence. Just look at the reactions to the Apple Vision Pro that is intentionally designed for a certain class of people who have a disposable $3,500 to drop, which is about half of the median savings of all US families. I would highly recommend watching Eddie Burback's latest video that goes into way more depth on that subject. And there are countless examples of this happening throughout history, like Google Glass a decade ago. Not only were they a stupid looking headset straight out of hackers, they were a symbol of wealth inequality that signaled to other poorer people that the wearer is probably an arrogant entitled transplant who can't stand the sight of unhoused people from the balcony of their $4,000 a month condo in Soma. The very nature of luxury tech is a sign of status and class, it's called luxury for a reason, that feels like a slap in the face to the majority of those it is gate kept from that is not exactly designed with 
inclusivity and accessibility in mind. Average people who are alienated and excluded from basic needs like food, shelter, and healthcare become even more resentful of the Patagonia-wearing tech bro who's out slumming it in a dive bar in a sketchy part of town with a clunky VR headset strapped to his face. I also wanna say that if you showed an idealistic 1980s computer whiz these two photos and asked them which one was the real world equivalent of a psychopathic tech conglomerate CEO, their head would cave in when you told them the guy from Hackers was fiction and the guy in the khakis who looks like he eats mayonnaise straight from the jar was the reality. Why we allow them to dress in non-threatening tones of beige <laughs> is beyond me, all while they lay off tens of thousands of employees without remorse using cryptic fintech buzzwords the entire time. Vandalizing this kind of tech, whether it be physically destroying it in the street or memeing it into oblivion is a form of protest. In all honesty, these tech companies should pay more attention to the reaction from the public and take some notes. There is no better way to figure out if you made a useless piece of overpriced glass and metal than seeing a video of a mob of people the system has utterly failed hunt down and destroy it like the townspeople in the Beauty and the Beast. You see, there is no right way to protest because that defeats the purpose of protesting. And yeah, it might not be a good look when a protest turns to a riot and people get hurt, but that's mainly because these acts are usually twisted by talking heads who carelessly throw around dog whistles by labeling everyone involved as thugs. And anyone who is annoyed or angry about some buildings or cars getting trashed is willfully missing the point and is mad about the wrong thing. They end up siding with corporations and institutions that fleece the average consumer and lobby for harmful policies meant to keep the average person at the bottom, not uplift them. Indoctrination, teaching people to accept a set of beliefs uncritically since at least 1646. These companies try to sell tech like driverless cars as a safer option and that the human element is inherently flawed and is the real root of the problem. But I feel much safer in a cab with Tony behind the wheel who's lived in the city he taxis in all his life and knows every back road, shortcut, and can set his watch by the traffic activity over some soulless car that's relying on an algorithm that has some pretty obvious flaws. I'll take Uber home sometimes and the map always goes the same way at a certain stretch that is objectively a less safe and longer route that I have to instruct the driver to ignore. I don't give a shit how many millions of miles a driverless car has logged when it has no comprehension about the actual world around it and all the factors that could potentially lead to a collision because of an unprotected intersection that's on a blind hill or that can be hacked or will trap you inside when the battery dies or the software updates because you weren't informed of the manual release lever. AI software in general is turning out to not be the magic that has been sold to us. We are already hitting a point in the AI hype cycle where a lot of businesses are realizing that it kind of sucks. And the reason that we're just gonna see letdown after letdown is because it's been massively overhyped. And the thing is, this technology is cool. There could have been a world in which generative AI was reasonably explained, its limitations understood, and it was rolled out in reasonably paced and responsible ways. But that, of course, is not the world we are living in. And so many companies just bought in to this idea that generative AI is magic and they must use it for everything right away. Most of these systems claimed that they would increase productivity without any more labor needed and we would all become hyper-efficient worker drones by automating tasks and eliminating the need to ever touch a keyboard again because of our puny human 65 words per minute typing skills bog down productivity. The thing is, when you have a product that has the potential to make certain jobs redundant, capitalists and industrialists take that to mean, oh, so I can just lay off even more people? Rather than come up with new jobs they can transfer into and instead refer to their workforce as a people tax? Every time yes. you add somebody, they bring up communication and like, like uh, they bring a tax yes. with them. So this is like productivity without the, with the tax of more people. Um, and I think the productivity doubles, you know, in somewhere between one and two years. It's a little hard to know, but it will be double. So we'll have the equivalent of twice the engineers um, without the productivity tax. And so that's the first thing is just getting everyone on the tools, get everyone a co-pilot and getting everyone like just immersed. And I just bang the drum, like use these tools as much as you can. I don't want to be like the Luddites or like afraid of a computer in the 1980s, right? Like we want to be yeah. using these tools. As with these self-driving cars, this new era of technology aims to eliminate people from every aspect of life. No drivers in cars, no redundant employees, no graphic designers or musicians or voice actors. 
Here's a suggestion. How about no more fucking CEOs, man? <laughs> Those are the only people these systems will benefit if left unchecked. The potential loss of jobs is not great when you've already got a wealth inequality gap that's eclipsing that of pre-revolution France. And listen, I understand the impulse to want to avoid every other human being as much as possible, especially the out of touch boomer coworker who doesn't know how to open a PDF. But if these automations are going to make human labor worthless in certain industries, then there needs to be some kind of social safety net in place to catch those being displaced like oh, I don't know, universal basic income, housing, and healthcare. And I know there's a stereotype that tech leaders and innovators are some of the most soulless weirdos out there, but it's beyond cold and calculating to look at your fellow man and think they are simply a flawed, inefficient meat popsicle. Negative, I am a meat popsicle. You're not a mentat, regardless of how robotic your speech patterns are and no matter how much you hate eating what human food. Heck? Are these people aliens? <laughs> Why are they all like this? <laughs> These cars and similar tech become nothing more than a nuisance for the average person. And I'm not saying that humans themselves are by any means more perfect or less flawed. Just the other day, a woman lost control of her car in San Francisco and crashed through a bus stop killing three people, including a child. And in defense of humans everywhere, she was 78, which is way too old to be behind the wheel, and more of an indication that evaluating driver capability needs to be completely overhauled, as well as driverless technology. It's just that at least humans have the ability to comprehend morals and ethics. What those ethics and morals are exactly is itself complicated, I know, and it brings up a pretty loaded philosophical question. Is it better to have a flawed human being behind the wheel who ages and can be reactionary, to put it mildly, or a cold, emotionless machine that is programmed with a universal corporate bias or agenda baked in? People are capable of compassion and empathy and understand most of the time when they make an error. When one of those autonomous food machines fucks up, it's incapable of realizing it made a mistake and doesn't stop and go, oh shit, sorry about that, let me clean it up and start over. It just continues to mime the process to completion. Driverless cars and AI currently can't comprehend the metaphysical and don't account for errors as far as I can tell or any consequences their decision-making algorithm might inflict. Twitter's AI Grok, for example, can't discern what parody is, so you get trending topics about how <laughs> the police were sent to the subway to shoot the earthquake they experienced the other day. These cars and these systems themselves feel no remorse or guilt and can't learn from those mistakes in the same way a human operator can. A programmer will just tweak some code and send it out an update and move on to the next deliverable listed in their Asana dashboard that must be completed by E. OD. That's the video. Thanks so much for sticking around. If you made it this far, you should know by now that means you're special. To all the new people that subscribed over the last couple of weeks because of that video about conservative coffee, what's up? Thanks. I appreciate all the engagement and the comments and the likes and uh, the subscriptions. It's fucking awesome. You can also become a member if you have three extra dollars a month just lying around. Uh, there's some exclusive content just for you guys and you'll get access to these videos a couple of days before anybody else. And also, my uh, undying adoration for your commitment to the channel. <laughs> Sounds crazy. Anyway, thank you so much again. Until next time, vanish.